Hey guys, Andre for the High Performance Academy and we're here with Nemo Racing, undoubtedly one of the most talked about teams from World Time Attack last year and coming here this year hoping to re retain their crown from last year. So we thought we'd just grab James here from MR Tuning and uh, do a bit of a technical tour of the car. So first of all, thanks James for joining us and uh, first of all, could you just give us a little bit of a brief rundown on, on what you do with Nemo Racing and where you've come from? Yeah, hi Andre. Um, we, look, my name's James, I manage MR Tuning in Queensland and we, uh, we basically specialise in preparing track day cars for people. Uh, we have driver, driver development sort of things as well as obviously specialise in anything from doing a generic suspension setup on a car to a full build such as this. And um, how did you get involved with the Nemo Racing team? Uh, we were approached by Chris uh, approximately two years ago and he had started to build a time attack car and obviously with how developed it had got he had no idea of how to finish it and and he was like I mean the brains trust behind the thing and knew what he wanted um, and we just provided the services to make that happen. Sounds like the perfect uh, opportunity for you guys to go nuts with a car. Can we start at the front of the car and um, we're just going to have a look at a few of the components in a bit more detail and, and get some information from you about them. So I mean there's not much of this Evo left that hasn't been seriously modified obviously. Uh, the heart of it obviously is the 4G63 engine. Could you give us a bit of a rundown on what's been done to the engine to make this car so competitive at World Time Attack? Yeah, so the uh, the cylinder head on it's actually a Cosworth head. Um, it's got a, our own special blend of camshafts and that sort of thing in it. It's got a Nitto 2.2 stroker kit um, and then a, a Norris Designs dry sump kit and oil pump and that sort of thing. We run an HKS Plenum and uh, this year we've also had full race and Borg Warner come on board with turbos and manifold etc. Great. So can I ask you, is it, is it secret? What sort of horsepower is the car producing at what sort of boost level? Um, it, it depends on the boost level obviously, um, we, we have up to 800 horsepower on tap and we're, we're prepared to push the thing obviously to over, over 40 psi boost. And word on the street is last year despite putting in that spectacular minute 25 zero lap with Warren at the wheel, word on the street is you weren't even pushing the engine that hard and it wasn't making that much power, is that right? Yeah absolutely, Look, um, our base tune for this year is already about 100 horsepower more than last year. Uh, last year, due, due to time restraints, last year we just had no way of um, really coming here with a successful engine package. So we threw something together that would get us to the event. Um, and the guys who built it did a great job and that was good enough to do the job on the day. It certainly did that. So full race you mentioned and Borg Warner have come on board with one of their new EFR series turbochargers. Uh, you ran a Garrett last year, is that correct? Uh, no, we actually ran the Borg Warner last year as well. Um, the, the main design change is obviously this year we've gone in, internally gated, uh, which appears to work really, really well. Last year we ran two external turbo smart wastegates. So the new internal wastegate EFR turbos basically simplified the whole installation for you? Absolutely. It t tidied up a lot of things under the bonnet. There's a, a lot less plumbing and a, a lot less moving parts, obviously. And um, everyone has apprehensions about internally gated turbos. Uh, this one appears to work really, really well, so it's a credit to Borg Warner. Great. And we can see, obviously, most of the front of the car has been cut off. And I've been walking around the pits for the last day and a half. It seems if you've got an Evo and you're at World Time Attack, if you haven't cut everything off forward of the strut towers, you're doing it wrong. Can you tell us a little bit about the philosophy behind that? Is it for weight saving? Is it to make the car easier to work on? A uh, bit of both. Like, I mean, obviously when you chop the front of the car off, to, to make it still strong and especially to handle the aero loads that this car goes through, it's, uh, you have to put a lot of bar work back into it. So weight saving's not that great. Um, but ease of access, like we within two bolts we can unbolt the whole front off the car and you have full access to the engine and gearbox. So to remove an engine and gearbox assembly out of it is a very quick job now. Okay, now you just touched on aero there as well and we know you've got a, a very smart guy in Andrew Brilliant that's um, come on board and he's been developing the aero package along with you guys. Obviously it's working insanely well. Can you give us some indication of what sort of levels of downforce you're seeing from the car? Yeah, once again, um, unfortunately we haven't done a, l a lot of testing with the car still, but the, the downforce levels are around 1,500 kilo, so it's obviously enough to be able to drive the car upside down if you had to, <laughs> um, but a no, phenomenal amount of downforce. Uh, that, that's truly impressive. And what, what is the total weight of the car? Uh, the total weight of the car, we had to put a fair bit of weight in it for this year to comply with the new rules, but um, at the moment it's a bit over 1,100 kilos. 
Okay. Okay, cool. Now if we come around here, I just wanted to look at the front suspension because the, the suspension on the car is very seriously modified. Um, can you give us a little bit of a rundown? Obviously the McPherson strut assembly from the factory Evo is gone. What's been done here? Yeah, the, the biggest problem is obviously the way uh, an Evo road car is designed, um, they're very, very good as a road car or a track day car. Uh, when you actually get into measuring all the geometry properly, which is a, a service we pride ourselves in doing with all our race cars, uh, the roll centres and bump, like all your bump travel and everything's just not quite right. And, and no matter what you do, the, try and get the geometry right, right with the McPherson struts, nearly impossible. So basically we chopped it all off, went for the double A arm, and you, you can design it and put the pickup points wherever you want, and so it all works ideal. Perfect. All right, let's move back and, and get into the, the cabin of the car. And um, the first thing, uh, I, again, I notice is you, you've got a lot of uh, material cut out of the car here. And, and I know that one of the, uh, the problems you had meeting this year's rules was the requirement for a B-pillar, which you didn't have in the car last year. Now we can see this uh, garish looking uh, green B-pillar. And if I, uh, I can actually twist it with my hand, and if we look up here, you can see it's uh, attached with uh, one little 5mm cap screw here. And uh, down the bottom, we've got another two cap screws holding it in. So the fact that uh, you've put this back in here and you've painted it, you've painted it green uh, and you've got three cap screws holding it in, is it safe to say it's not really a structural member anymore? Yeah, no, definitely no structural integrity to it at all. The, the, we obviously painted it green as a, a bit of a joke. It was a fairly sore subject last year with a lot of people with this car not having a B-pillar. Um, the B-pillar in a car doesn't do a lot anyway, especially the time you put a comprehensive roll cage in it. The main reason for us removing it was for ease of driver access. Like, I mean, we tried to make this car as safe as possible and having the B-pillar in the way was just no good. So the, this year we have relocated it, which is within the rules, and we've painted it green just to, so that everyone can see it's there. Nice touch, I like your style. Okay, can we just talk a little bit about the electronics components or the electronics package that you've got in the car? Uh, I can see a lot of MoTeC gear in here. Obviously the car's high end and so is the electronics to go along with it. Talk us through what you've got managing the engine, the gearbox and the, the data analysis. Yeah, so the um, the engine, basically it's it's got MoTeC for miles. So there's a M800 controlling the engine. It has PDMs front and rear just to obviously give us the, the amount of options we needed to run everything. Just, just to clear that up for uh, anyone viewing, so the MoTeC PDM is a power distribution module and uh, basically that replaces your usual relays and fuses and electronically switches the loads. Yeah, absolutely, Andre. Um, the, We've also running the MoTeC MDC to control the, the factory Evo ACD, like the active centre diff. Um, we run a SparkTech unit for, for the CDI, for the ignition. SparkTech obviously came on board and provided all that with, for us this year and it's worked really well. The, the gear shift in it, it's, um, it's got a gear, Geartronics paddle shift kit in it, which is um, out of the UK, so it runs its own little gear ECU as well, uh, which is fully programmable and we can make it do whatever we want pretty much. On the note of the gearbox with the paddle shift, what uh, what is the actual gearbox you're using in the car? The actual gearbox is a Mac track, which is also out of the UK as well. Uh, it's a six-speed sequential gearbox normally, um, but then we've put this Geartronics kit on it to make it paddle shift. Great. Okay, let's uh, let's move back a little bit further, and um, if we have a look, first of all, at the rear suspension. So you've got much the same design by the looks of it in the rear of the car as you have in the front, and um, you've also got some uh, massive underbody tunnels there for the aero. Um, can you tell us a little bit about the rear suspension and how important that is? Yeah. So well, once again, the same as the front, the uh, the McPherson the McPherson strut, and also sort of the the double A arm that comes out in the rear of a Mitsubishi Evo. It's not ideal, especially when you lower the car as much as we wanted to lower it. Um, so the, the easiest way, once again, was to chop it all out, go for an equal length upper and bottom A arm, and uh, with a, a custom upright, and you, you can set your geometry to whatever you want, so that it all works perfectly, and um, and that's what we have. Great. Now another source of uh, confusion for a lot of people was this huge gullwing door that you've got on the side of the car. Pretty unique, pretty different. Um, some people loved it, some people hated it. What was the idea behind that? A um, cu couple of ideas. One being, once again, because of how far back the driver sits, to, to have a normal length door on it is a, a really hard to get in and out. So you would have had to have made sort of a long door and a short door anyway. To, to make moulds and to, to go through the process of doing all of that is very hard. So it was easy to just build basically a mould of the whole side of the car, make one big long door. And then once we had the door made, we sort of 
work through how to open it. Obviously because it is so long the easiest way to make it open and close was to go upwards instead of pivoting off the front like a conventional door. Perfect. Okay, so we'll move back towards the back of the car and the, the only last thing I really want to talk about here is the um, a bit more of the aero. So we've obviously got this absolutely insane rear wing which is massive. What's it, about uh, two metres wide? Yeah, yeah, it's actually a bit over. So it's, um, believe it or not, the, the rear wing's too wide to fit in our transporter. So when it, when it comes to transporting the car, we have to remove the, the rear wing as well as the front clip with the gurney flaps and everything on it. That's got to be a little bit inconvenient. You've also got the, uh, the tunnels underneath the car and um, these, uh, these huge wings off the, uh, the exit from the rear, rear wheel arches. So it, it's, it's definitely a unique looking car. The closest I've seen to anything in, in general motorsports probably the, uh, the German touring cars, the DTM cars. But um, hey look, it's obviously working for you guys. I heard uh, some numbers from, from last year here despite the fact you reset the, the lap record here for a tin top car by, by several seconds I understand. Um, at the same time the car I understand was also somewhere around about 40 kilometres slower at the end of the front straight than uh, the likes of a V8 supercar, is, is that accurate? Yeah absolutely, like I mean once again due to, due to the horsepower that it didn't have last year um, and, and the extreme amount of aero loads on it, it with, with aero comes drag and uh, to try and push it down the straight is, is very hard. Um, last year with the car being so fresh there was a few things, a lack of horsepower and the gear ratios being a bit wrong were, meant we couldn't achieve our top speed down the front straight. This year we've worked on that and obviously the, the more horsepower will help that as well. Definitely, I, I think it's still a, a pretty good indicator of how effective this aero is though to give that much drag, you're sapping that much uh, straight line speed and yet obviously the car can just go around the corner and maintain that cornering speed. Hey look James, thank you very much for talking to us, it's been great having a chat, uh, we hope that you guys have a great weekend and can't wait to see the car out on the track, cheers. For online tuning courses visit learntotune.com.